Hello, my name is Dr. Yuri Quintana, and I'm delighted and honored to be speaking to you at the 10th eMental Health Conference. Today, I'll be talking to you about work I'm doing with colleagues across Canada and around the world to build evidence on the efficacy of eMental Health systems, methods to scale them, and sharing that knowledge towards building a global eMental Health community. I am the Chief of the Division of Clinical Informatics at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, and Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm also a collaborating scientist at Homewood Research Institute in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, and an adjunct associate professor at Health Information Science Program at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. By way of disclosure, our division here at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center has received funding from Pfizer to provide medical informatics training programs that will not be discussed in this presentation. And I have received research grants from the National Institutes of Health, AHRQ funding specifically for an online platform called InfoSage uh, that's being used for research studies with older adults and European Union funding for projects called Unicom and Gravitate projects, which will not be discussed in this presentation. For managing potential biases, no commercial products will be mentioned in this presentation, and the funding for the projects discussed in this presentation come from nonprofit organizations in Canada, specifically RBC Foundation, FRAME, and Homewood Research Institute. So the objectives for today are to understand the current evidence on e-mental health, discuss strategies for how to scale those systems and services, and discuss approaches for how we could co-create a global e-mental health community. The vision is to be able to generate evidence and implementation science knowledge and to be able to share that worldwide with a mission to increase access and quality of integrated mental health and substance use services. The idea is to co-design with service providers, clients, patients, families, people with lived and living experience, and governments to build high quality e-mental health systems and substance use services that can reach people where they need it and when they need it. We want to build a data-driven strategy that is evidence-based, that can improve access, and has a real-time method to be able to monitor and improve and develop evaluation programs. So one of the challenges is that we have a very fragmented healthcare system. And so there are lots of different ways in which people can uh, engage with different groups and providers. There are also different modalities. There's in-person visits, there's telehealth, there's an explosion of mobile health services, there are community centers. And so to be able to navigate this is very difficult, but it's also very difficult for providers to get a, a holistic picture of what services are available and how to develop an integrated blended strategy. We've heard at this conference many people that are making great inroads towards that, but we have much more work to do to be able to build something that is useful both for the patients to be able to navigate, but also have the data to be able to evaluate these programs and be able to tailor them in a faster way. We also need to look at issues of cost, and so uh, there are different ways in which we can deliver these services. And while we want to lower costs, we also want to give the best quality service. We also need to look at accessibility and how to provide these services where people need it and in the ways that they need it. And so developing an integrated strategy requires collaboration and data to be able to share among these centers so that we can develop these integrated strategies. So the goals are to improve access for both mental health and substance use services and generate integrated ways to connect technologies, communications, referrals, and evaluations of different interventions. We want to have the ability to use data to be able to evaluate these digital e-mental health services and use that data to tailor the content, the experience for each individual so they can receive the right content at the right place and in the modality that's best for them at that particular time in their life. And we need to be able to create performance measures uh, for the system and to be able to share that knowledge, not in a competitive way to put one uh, location behind another, but so that we can all learn and all rise together and be, be able to deliver integrated systems that serve the population. 
So this topic has been talked about a lot in different uh, circles and groups. The National Institute of Medicine um, many years ago, which now is called the National Academies in the United States, a leading think tank of leading uh, academics, service providers, and scientists, uh, have discussed this topic and they developed this concept called the learning health system. And the idea is that gen evidence is generated from scientific and other sources of what uh, is uh, known to work. We then develop strategies to implement these within healthcare systems and then we evaluate them again. And then we scale them across larger numbers of institutions and providers. And in each step there is evaluation, but there's also a backflow to be able to uh, share the knowledges, both to the people who are generating that evidence and the people who are trying to scale that. In concept, this sounds great and we need to try to work towards it. But the reality is that it's very, very difficult to build this because we have much fragmentation in the system and not enough collaboration. This group uh, had, many years ago, had the goal by 2020 to have 90% of clinical decisions that would be supported by accurate, timely, and up-to-date clinical information that would reflect the best available evidence. And the sad truth that 2020 came and went, and we're nowhere near the 90% level in part because we are not able to connect the dots, collect the data, do more real-time evaluation, and be able to bring the right evidence to the right people to deliver the best strategies. So we're making progress, but we have a long way to go. I spent over 12 years working at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, working with colleagues at that hospital, and colleagues around the world building a global network called Cure for Kids. And it was a global community of practice that developed evidence-based care guidelines for pediatric oncology. And it started in Central America, but grew worldwide. Groups developed uh, evidence-based strategies for treating uh, pediatric cancer that were adapted to each region based on their available resources. One of the wonderful things about this is that all the knowledge was open access and groups worked together to share those uh, evidence-based protocols and treatment strategies. More importantly, they also work to be able to standardize how they collected data and outcomes to be able to learn from each other, and they would meet on a regular basis, usually weekly, to be able to share those implementation strategies. Central America had tremendous success in collaboration, which was then replicated in Africa, Asia, and other parts around the world. So this became one of those learning healthcare systems where there was sharing of knowledge, but also implementation and outcomes and these communities grew over time. There were over 40,000 users in the first decade of this, and over 400 online communities of practice were on this platform of collaboration, sharing knowledge, and collaborating. And this wasn't just physicians, but it was nurses, social workers, and many other stakeholders working together. So the idea is, how do we take some of these examples of global online communities of practice and be able to bring them to other areas? One of the key success factors of this is that was that there was a commitment to share that knowledge and that it was evidence-based guidelines and, and care pathways to be able to help each other on how to implement those uh, at local levels. And there was also a commitment to uh, analyze outcomes and standardize how we collected those outcomes and we helped build some of the tools to be able to develop it. It became a global community of people helping each other, so it wasn't just one hospital or another, it became a global network. And the idea is to be able to take that types of models to mental health. So towards that, uh, two years ago, HRI partnered with, uh, with funding with RBC, partnered with stakeholders across Canada and around the world to develop a framework to develop the efficacy of mental health apps for youth. And so one of the problems we have right now is that there are thousands of apps, but there are actually relatively few rigorous studies that evaluate the efficacy of these apps. And there are many different frameworks for how to evaluate, but one of the things that we were seeking to do is to develop a very detailed, rigorous framework that had very specific criteria to be able to evaluate it. And the idea is to be able to use this as a basis to begin generating some of the evidence that we need for being able to not only evaluate these apps, but figure out how to scale them at large, uh, large levels. And so the, the in, uh, reports which are freely available on the Homewood 
Research Institute website, um, gives you some examples of the current state that there was um, in the last year. And that is that even though there are thousands of apps, there are relatively few evaluations, most of those evaluations are within the first 30 days of usage, and many of them have small sample sizes. And when we start comparing the different evaluations, they use different metrics and scales, and so it's very difficult to evaluate and compare uh, two different similar applications um, because of the difference in research study designs and measurement uh, scales. Also, many evaluations haven't been replicated or scaled. There are some, yes, but we need more, and we need to be able to standardize some of these metrics so that we can learn from each other. And it's also very difficult sometimes to disseminate this knowledge, especially when projects haven't been sustained. And we also identified some policy implications that need to be done to be able to have better safeguarding of that data so that we can share it with consent, um, but properly with different groups that want to be able to learn from that data. Uh, so I'll give you just a brief sample of what uh, this framework includes. It includes criteria, for example, uh, for who developed the app so that there's transparency uh, of that. One of the things we did different from other uh, previous frameworks is to have more specificity on how you evaluate each one of these criteria. In terms of design, we called on having more clear definitions of how these were evaluated, scientific approaches for evaluating usability, and being able to co-create them and be able to document how you've co-created those solutions. In data management, there are different criteria, for example, for privacy. So it's not just good enough to be able to say they should have a privacy policy but and that it complies with legal laws, but it must be re, uh, in a way that is readable and understood by people. And for youth, this is particularly important because some of these are extremely complicated, even for adults. And so we need very clear uh, privacy and how that data is, is shared. More importantly, or equally importantly, there's also uh, evaluation of both short-term and long-term outcomes. And so this is measuring the efficacy of these. Does the evaluation have face validity? Did you measure the effect of those, uh, those outcomes, both over short-term and long-term? And one of the biggest challenges that we have facing us is that sometimes these apps aren't used alone. They're used in conjunction with other services. So how do you measure the relative contribution of the app versus in-person visits and other, uh, other e, uh, technologies? And so we need to do uh, a factor analysis to be able to measure the relative impact and measure all of this. So there's much work more to be done. And we must also realize that these apps don't work alone. Um, that there are different times and points at which these apps uh, should be used. So no one app can solve all uh, conditions at all times of the patient journey. And so here you see a typical journey of, of uh, a patient. Uh, this is not necessarily specific to mental health, but to most conditions where there's a, a phase uh, where there's a possibility of prevention. There is then a screening phase where you need to be able to measure severity. And so there may be some apps that are mainly designed for prevention or screening. So we need clarity as to where these apps are intended for. Then there are apps that might be intended for treatment. And so we need clarity as to whether there's an intent to treat and how those were evaluated. And finally, there may be other sets of apps that may be used for maintenance, such as recovery monitoring and support uh, after, after treatment. And so we need to be able to understand how to uh, be able to uh, assign the right app to the right person at the right time and help them navigate through this. Uh, we also need to realize that at any one of this, uh, these steps in the journey, people may be visiting multiple locations. So they may be going to an on-site visit, they may be accessing the web, have a combination of on-site and virtual visits and an app. And so part of our work right now is to try to understand how to build not only standardized metrics, but to be able to understand this journey to be able to understand how to tailor interventions over this journey so that you can give the right blend of technologies that makes sense for that person's condition and preferences. And so when we start to look at the evaluations, there's a broad range of measurement uh, scales and metrics. And here you see some of the scales that uh, are available for anxiety and depression. Some of these have been validated and are reliable. 
some of them have not. And so the question is, which one of these should uh, have been uh, evaluated for reliability and validity? And how can we then decide which ones people should use? If everyone uses completely different scales, it'll be very difficult to sort of compare outcomes. So there are different communities of groups that are reviewing these scales and trying to come up with a consensus agreement of which ones are the best ones to use, when you should use them, and how to standardize the reporting of those outcomes in a way that allows comparison. So there is a group uh, out of Boston, ICHOM, that has developed uh, many of these scales for different conditions, including mental health. There are groups like Comet and others around the world that have developed. And while I think they've done some great work, I think this is still in its early stages, and we need to continue to look at these scales, and particularly in the digital context, but because not only do we need outcomes at the end of treatment, we need other types of measures as you're going progressing through the, the journey. So some of these other scales that you could also use need to also be uh, reviewed for validity and reliability. And so the question is, which instruments should you use and what metrics at what different time points have them been validated? What is the definition for reliability and validation and where is the evidence that sort of proves that that scale is really reliable uh, and valid? How do we take the input from people with lived and lived experience that would help inform whether these are actually the best ways to measure um, and observe the condition of, of the person? Have they been used in digital e-mental health? Are they feasible to integrate? Some of these are very long surveys and maybe uh, too long in, in some cases for certain types of applications. Are they in the public domain free to use um, or are there restrictions for, for their use? And which ones should you use? So with some recent funding from uh, RBC Foundation and FRAME and Homewood Research Institute, We've begun to uh, uh, review these scales, and we've assembled a team to be able to look at all these different metrics, not only outcomes, but intermediate metrics, to be able to define some standardized outcomes that would allow real-world assessment of these digital health interventions so that we can do these comparative studies and learn from, uh, from each other. So part of this project involves doing a systematic review of mental health apps for youth experiencing anxiety and depression and summarizing uh, what we find from those uh, evaluations and what scales and metrics are currently being used. Another part of this project is looking at those scales and trying to define which ones have been scientifically validated and being able to recommend a consent from this consensus group which scales we recommend people should be using. And one of the exciting things about this project is that from the get-go, we've involved people with lived and lived experience who are informing us and helping us develop um, the assessments of these measurement approaches. And finally, we will disseminate all of this information publicly uh, through scientific publications and webinars. And so here are some of the people that are participating in this project, and we thank them for their contributions and thoughts and so this project will be going over, uh, on for the next few months and we look forward to later this year being able to share the outcomes of this project globally. Uh, I also want to particularly thank the people with lived and lived experience who are participating in this project because their ideas about how the system works, how what we should be focusing are really essential and these are themes that have been mentioned throughout this conference and I continue to learn from all, all of them and I'm delighted that FRAME has helped us identify youth and family caregivers who are uh, true partners in developing um, these uh, approaches for measurement. So they are part of our uh, panel committee and there will be some town halls. So if you're interested in this project, please let us know. We're happy to tell you more about it. So as we develop this evidence of knowledge of how to evaluate this and what works, what doesn't, we need to start to developing an approach to be able to share this knowledge as broadly as we can. Not only what works, but how to implement this and how to scale them. And as, as different people try different approaches to scaling, they will learn things. And so it'd be, it's essential that uh, other people who are trying to do similar things can learn from others. And so we've built a platform called Alicanto that we're using in different medical domains. We have an Alicanto for cancer, for adult cancer that we're using and sharing. There's a new one that will, uh, will be out soon on diabetes. 
And our hope is that one day to use this technology also to bring people around the world to share knowledge and collaborate. So this has been built as a collaboration platform here. And it's called Alicanto because in a lot of healthcare, we live in a lot of silos. Different institutions have their are acts sometimes as silos within the institution. Different departments have, are sometimes their silos, and systems sometimes have different silos of, of data. And so, whether by intention or not, it is very difficult sometimes to collaborate because of the siloed environment. And so, Alicanto tries to create a connection between people and systems so that we can have a place to collaborate and create the ways that we can securely share data and be able to view outcomes data to be able to learn from each other. It's named after a mythical bird from Chile because I have heritage from Chile and that uh, that bird glows in the dark and helps miners come out of mines. So Alicante is trying to bring people out of their silos to collaborate, share knowledge so we can, so we can benefit everyone. This is uh, the Alicanto that's being used at my hospital, and it's being used by 13 hospitals within our, uh, our network uh, to be able to standardize cancer treatments and so that the centers can all learn from each other, and uh, it's a living lab. Um, and so the idea for mental health is that we can sort of generate evidence not only on how the app works, but how we can scale it and integrate it. And so for that, we need to be able to develop digital tools to track how that app integrates to different services and how we can measure outcomes, not only while you're using the app, but how you also integrate it with other services to make sure we can develop the right blend. And so we need to be able to develop knowledge and train people on how to do this. So it's not enough to just say you have money to buy the, uh, the app. We need to also provide funding for training so that these organizations can develop the digital infrastructure, train their staff on how to implement, manage, and use all of these digital tools. That's a, a real sort of uh, underfunded area that needs careful attention, not only to implement that, but to share that knowledge of that training. And I see in this conference several groups starting to do projects on that, and we need uh, foundations and governments and other organizations to also participate in, in funding that initiative so that we can truly scale it. We also need more evidence on digital therapies and evaluating uh, apps and the method uh, that we evaluate them and the standardized outcomes that we want to do, which is what we've talked about already. But then we need to be able to have a uh, share that knowledge and get people to actually use those standards so that we can actually learn. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have lots of different standards committee and no one uses the standards. The idea is to be able to actually get consensus and have people use that so we can learn from each other. And finally, we need performance measurement of uh, systems and we need better tools and methods to be able to share that at a systems level and be able to share that knowledge so that we compare s systems. Again, not trying to put one uh, region or one uh, organization ahead or behind another, they'll all have things that they're doing well and other things that they're having challenges, but so that we can all learn for how we overcame challenges and all improve together. So this is what a continuous learning system is. It's a community that wants to work together on some common goals, where they want to share training, they want to implement uh, those uh, digital and face-to-face -face strategies and be able to learn from those care delivery. They want to do quality improvement, but share what they learn from those quality improvement with uh, other organizations, and then to uh, work together with academics who are trying to develop new methodologies for delivering e-mental health services. So we can't be siloed. We need to be more actively engaged, and it can't be just once, once a year at a conference. We need more formal engagement. And so what facilitates that is a critical mass of people who want to collaborate, where there's transparent and inclusive leadership, where they want to agree on some common uh, methodologies, outcome standards uh, for being able to evaluate that, and there's a supportive community, and where there's opportunity for growth for everyone in, in that organization. Uh, and these could be virtual organizations that cross institutional boundaries and national boundaries. And things that are barriers is when there are dominating personalities where one group wants to get the credit um, and where the community is unresponsive or unwilling to help each other. So a collaborative roadmap is to, for us to be able to identify projects that we can work across institutions and across countries to be able to co-design solutions, have consistent ways of evaluating that, 
and be able to start developing data models for how we are going to record those evaluations so we can compare. Key to that is to define some common metrics for these digital interventions and methodologies. And then also key to this is having a sustained online community that shares best practices uh, on an ongoing continuous basis. So in conclusion, do apps work? Many do not, some do, but we need more comprehensive evaluations that are science-based and transparent approaches that are based on rigorous scientific evaluation and also informed with inf input from people with lived and lived experience so can truly understand the outcomes of how they work and how they could be scaled. Are we ready to scale at this point? No, I don't think so. Most locations don't have enough technology, training, and capacity to be able to uh, scale these systems at large scales to thousands or millions of people. So we're going to need more infrastructure, more training, and we're going to need to be able to learn how to tailor services to individuals. That requires data and analytics to be able to, to do that. And so we need a very serious investment in that area. And can we collaborate to work that, towards this? Yes, we can. And I think we need to, because no one institution can do it all. And we must have ways to be able to work with each other so that we can achieve better success. So there's an African proverb that says that if you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I've been delighted to work with so many amazing Canadian colleagues that have been so incredibly collaborative and, and welcoming. I want to thank particularly uh, Dr. Roy Cameron and Brian Rush, who have been incredible mentors and friends and colleagues, uh, and many people at uh, Homewood, Frame, and, um, and HRI, who have been tremendous uh, supporters, as well as the Harvard community and global collaborators. I do a lot of global health work as well, and one of the most exciting things is to work with people in other countries where they have tremendous collaborative spirit. And so my hope is that the community in Canada can work with communities in Asia and Africa and other places, and so that we all have learning systems around the world uh, that are in interconnected and we can learn from each other. So I want to thank you for um, listening to this talk, and I'd love to learn from you, engage with you, and, and meet you, uh, hopefully in person in the, in the future, but certainly virtually. Thank you.